So I'm what it's uh, got thousand shares of twenty three and me. What are you doing there? What's your thesis on twenty three and me? Uh it's gonna get bought out. Uh, but, uh, oh, you think it's gonna get bought out? Uh they have good. They have good. Uh, good. Um, they have good. Um, some decent. Um, um, intellectual property, but um, I mean, six hundred and seventy bucks. What is that? That's nothing. So I'm gonna play options on him to, uh, you know, so I could have a negative. Uh... Twenty three and me holdings. I, I I I believe her her story. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, they spent money too fast. Obviously, I don't blame her for it. You know, it, it, the okay. I ordered twenty three and me about ten years ago. I mm -hmm. did it once, and I have no reason to get anything else. You know, there's no reason to be a repeat customer. But the thing is, they, they I, I believe they, they have, uh, they, they have information that a larger company might buy them, buy them out for. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Uh, I mean, I've not looked at this company. Uh, it's too small for me to. You know, uh, to look at right now for initiating any new position. But if you believe that the data that this company has is going to be valuable, uh, sure. I mean, just make sure you position size it accordingly because it looks like it's been a consistent downtrend. And well, I'll uh, just sell options on it. I'm going to get my money back. Uh, for instance, uh, three years ago, I bought VIR. It had one of the first uh, therapeutic things for uh, COVID, and like a dumbass, I just held on to it. So now it's like worth worth one sixth what I paid for it. Yeah. I I haven't done any options on it or anything, you know. But uh, so even not, it takes ten years for for a vaccine to come out, yeah, or or, or anything to come out. So. Uh, Again, it's your money. Uh, do what you want to do with your money. I'm looking at 23andMe. Um, yeah, the options are too wide. So, so I, it doesn't seem to be a great vehicle for even selling options. The strike prices are like, a obviously, it's 50 cents and the share trading at 60 cents. Uh, anyway. I hopefully uh, your position size it accordingly. Can I give you a story? Okay, uh, back in December 2008, I met someone uh, at the university I was going to. Uh, actually, his specialty, uh, he was a, a, a dean, a vice dean, uh, was uh, technology. I didn't know that. I don't know. I, I was arrogant back then. And he said he bought a hell of a lot of shares at 88 cents. Uh, which was below their uh, their initial off uh, in, uh, their uh, their investment. I think they paid like a dollar two 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 fifty. But anyways, nevertheless, two years later, uh, the company uh, sold out at thirty three dollars. So, so um, here's I mean, my experience and your experience could be very different is your you know i don't believe on whatever anyone else says because i've also seen the other stories uh one of my very good i mean the person that i've known for almost 20 1998 that makes it about 26 years almost 25 years very close person we are still friends he knew his friend knew a board member of uh uh this guy um SPCE, what's a Virgin Galactic? Uh -huh. Right. And and he told me when the stock was around 2026 20, that info, uh, obviously it's not, you can't talk publicly about it, but it says this is going to go to 50. There are so many things lined up. Where did SPCE go, went from $26 to now? Uh, so, so here's the deal. Sometimes these things will work out and you think everyone is a genius. 
and uh, what doesn't work out, then I think, oh, you know, you are dumb. So I decided, I've always decided I'm going to do my own research and see what works for me. So now the Virgin Galactic is trading at dollar seventy nine, right? So, <clears throat> so I don't believe on anyone. You may want to, or at least what I would do is, hey, I'm going to go and do my own research. Oh and yeah, and figure out if I want to invest in that. Or well, not. it's only six hundred and seventy dollars. But anyway, yeah, that's fine. That's my fine. brother in law works at Lamb Research when it was uh, started at twenty dollars, right? Yeah. So Lamb and Research every time I call him up. He tells me it sucks. It's gonna go out of business. Excuse <laughs> me. All right. Okay. Uh, Jay says, uh, "What do you think of stock analysis compared to Finviz?" Uh, I like stock analysis, especially because they have a lot of uh, uh, data available to them. I only look at uh, this particular page of stock analysis right now. I, I in fact have stock analysis open at my end because I look at the confluent. Uh, stock went up like 30% after earnings. I'm like, what the heck Confluent did? Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I like stock analysis, especially the overview of financials. Uh, you know, quarterly, they have tons of data available on financials. Uh, this is where I get my data from. But I haven't looked at the other areas wherein, uh, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the, probably the area that I focused on stock analysis is just this. Finviz is, uh, I'm Finviz. I use it because I can build my own screeners on Finviz. Um, it, it seems stock analysis has even more possibly screener uh, filters, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't uh, tried that. I mean, it does say screener. I've never looked at or, or tried this. But it has I two hundred filters. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I uh, like this one. I mean, I have to spend time on this. So Finviz, I had a subscription, which I have no, I think this is my last free year. I probably am not going to review it. Maybe I'll try stock analysis. I had Coifin is also good. Um, not tried it. I think I opened an account, but not tried it. Nowadays, I'm uh, hearing a lot of chatter around FinChat. So, fin yeah, chat. you know, th there are many, um, I guess, these analysis uh, softwares. We just have to get comfortable with whatever works. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, Ramesh is saying, pump and dump, do your own research. Exactly. Uh, I, I don't believe on whatever. Even whatever folks on the CNBC comes and say, I just, uh, I always, you know, be skeptic. Little bit uh, skeptical on whatever people say. Cool um, anything else? Any new other stuff uh, anyone has done before we get into today's session? So again, my focus is, I think it's going to be earnings, 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 a lot of earnings coming up. Uh, so do want to spend time on reviewing some of those. Uh, unless you have something else, any other topic or area you want us to look at? Today is mostly focused on earnings. Any new stock anyone tried? We talked about 23 and me. Or... My, uh, my friend hit it big in ARM. Um, ARM, okay. On that big pump up. So that morning, a, a new call option strike opened at 130 and he took a chance on it and put 200 bucks. And in an hour, it got out at $3,200 profit as it was going up. So that's not the type of trading I do, but I guess it worked out for him. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, looked at ARM because ARM jumped like 30%. Uh, not 30, 60%. Yeah, yeah. 60% after earnings. I think I also tweeted because, uh, and I can understand. I looked at the results. That wasn't that great a, a result, but... I think if you're talking about ARM, I think I have a I have a chart here. Let's maybe let's jump onto uh, that chart of ARM. Where is my ARM? Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, this one. It's an eighty billion dollar company, and it went up like sixty percent, as if it's trading like a penny stock, right? Um, and the reason um, for this one, I, and number one, of course, it's AI frenzy, but a lot of companies are. Uh, moving the 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 way they are moving because they think it's the next Nvidia. It probably could be, 
but anyone who is investing in arm please please understand right now the float available in arm is very less so a lot of this movement that we are seeing is because there's only 10% float that is available so when arm came ipo and we reviewed during that ipo it was like 90% of the company is still held by softbank they only release 10% of the shares available so with such a low float it's going to have a wild movements and it will, it will have the wild movements in both the directions you know upside or downside because there's so much of uh, only 10% of the shares are available for trading in the open market so i i just stay away but i also saw there are like 150 dollar uh, calls a lot of buying on 150 dollar calls uh, i'm like what the heck so someone is just trying to you know swing it more power to them not something that i do but it's uh, good to understand the structure so let's look at arm um, right uh, 15th march looking at the next monthly expiration 150 dollars you have a thousand um calls open at 150 bucks the iv doesn't even seem that high for the kind of a movement yes iv has now come down a bit uh i think yeah i i saw close to 150 iv but but again i'm also remember another thing i think on the um it's on i think 12th of march the initial unlock from the IPO will materialize. So it went IPO whenever it. So generally there's a 60 days or not 60 days, six months of IPO lockup period. And that's lockup period going to expire on 12th of March. So we may see a lot of shares coming onto the market after lockup expire. Right? And uh, I don't want to be the one holding the bag when SoftBank or whatever, the, the institutional investors who held, still hold that 90% gonna dump on, uh, on the retail guys. So yeah, if, I mean, right now the times are wild. At least uh, I wasn't active in uh, during the dot-com uh, mania, but I guess what I hear is the vibes are like the same ones. You know, you put a, instead of a dot com, you put an AI behind your company name or you come and talk about AI in earnings call. That's it. And the stock just jumps up 20, 30, 40 percent. Right. Uh, look at another one, SMCI. Right. Uh, again, riding the coattails of AI. SMCI. Okay. <laughs> okay. This, I think I have a max chart open right now. <laughs> Look, look at this movement. So let's go to uh, one year one day, right? It's year to date, it's up 160%. 160% year to date. And this company, uh, I mean, they, they, as far as I understand, again, I have not done, done deeper dive into this one, but my understanding is this company provides and configures servers and installed into the racks, um, especially focused on the server workloads, uh, which are being used for AI. If anyone hold this company and know a little more about it, please chime in. But my understanding, that's what SMCI does. They don't create chips. They don't write, they don't write software. They do configure and install and, and the servers that are being used for AI. What's the amount of, uh, how much can you, uh, you know, so the, it's not a software business where you can have high turn margins, right? It's, and, and I don't understand that why it should go 160% uh, in a, in a year. So SMCI, so margin profiles, I don't think this is going to be like Google like margins or software like margins. So let's go to, to, to Right, so does it show the margins? It should show, yeah, there we go. 10% operating margin is 10%. Eight or 9% uh, profit margin. So let's look at, maybe let's look at a quarterly. 
because the AI phenomenon has only been around for last three quarters or so, even in that case, it's like a 10% operating margin, 17%, it's like less than 20% gross margin. And uh, what's the valuation that we are giving to this company? I don't even know where to search for those metrics on those analysis. Let's go back to this one. Uh, 57, 60 PE. Even forward PE is like 28. For a company that has got 20% of gross margin, close to 10% operating margin in the just that it's right in the coattails of AI. It has got something to do with AI. So I guess these must have been the similar time, it's, would have been a similar times during dot .com. Uh, those who have been around probably can talk about it. I wasn't here. <clears throat> I wasn't active. So I don't know. But I guess, you know, later on, I can tell my grandkids, I lived through AI frenzy. And I hopefully, and I survived. But anyway. I think another thing is that they also came and uh, raised their uh, guidance. So yeah, it does deserve a jump, but I don't think it deserve 160 percent jump. Right. I see another comment from myself, but this is not same as dot com period. Still, I learned not to chase. Let the dust settle. Check it out. The invest a little. Yeah, position size matters. You want to take a speculative position? Let's make sure it's a lottery ticket position and not a position uh you know that not a money that you need for to run your household yeah <clears throat> you can always take a chance uh, but then only deploy your chance money uh it's another common gut ask how do you select stock for week discussion huh? i mean right now it's earnings if i'm bringing in a lot of the earning stocks or if i uh see a stock which have moved a lot and then I understand, hey, why did it move? Does it make sense to talk about it? Only if the business is good, right? So I don't I don't talk about penny stocks here. I mean, because I don't invest in, I don't want to waste my time on penny stocks. Uh, if a business is good and the stock has been beaten up, that's where I think you can get an alpha and I do want to talk about it. And I think today I'll bring up a couple of those stocks that we talked about it. Uh, stocks fell on 40%, 50%, and then I go and look at the business. And I'm like, I don't think that the business is that bad. Is it that market has uh, uh, has become too pessimistic? And can we, uh, and again, just an education opinion, right? I'm, I'm not giving an advice, but can we look at, uh, you know, does it make sense to maybe initiate a position or not? So uh, I'll bring up one talk. I don't know if it's for today's discussion or not. Uh, but uh, let me just look at the document. But uh, oh, okay, I don't, I don't have it. But maybe we can talk about it. More, I can pull up the document. I can add it. So, yeah. So that's what I uh, I select. Uh, Sachin says uh, this time it is different, right? There's the four most dangerous words in investing. Is this time it is different. The reason could be different. Human behavior all the time is always the same. We always go through the cycle of greed. Uh, we went through the greed cycle in 1960s. You add Onyx behind your company name, electronics, electronics, um, the shares will jump 200%. We went through uh, the similar stuff in 1980s. You become a conglomerate. You're trying to do mergers and acquisitions, becoming big, uh, shares will jump. We went through in 1990, late 1990, you add a dot com, you'll see the frenzy. We went through in 2017, you add a blockchain in your name. Does anyone remember Long Island Tea? Uh, it used to make, it, it, it used to make, uh, uh, I think it still makes that uh, the green tea or whatever. They changed their name to Long Island Blockchain, share with like 100%, right? So, it's the reasons are always different, but the human behavior still does stay the same. So I don't think this AI is going to be any different. In, is AI going to change the world? Absolutely. Are these players the ones that's going to change the world? Ah, uh, I don't know. Right. All the early, um, early movers, first movers of internet, where are they? 
I remember thinking about Exodus Communications, uh, Jungli, Yahoo. Yahoo, I think, survived the longest before it folded and sold it itself to Verizon. All have gone. Internet has changed the life, of course, for good. Internet has increased productivity, of course. Increased commerce, of course. All the theory about internet has proven to be right. The problem is the businesses that started in 2000, most of them are no longer around. So I'm sure AI is going to improve the productivity that we're talking about. AI is going to make the world better. AI field opportunity in AI could be bigger than internet. But I don't know, is NVIDIA going to be the one that become the eventual winner? Is SMCI going to be the eventual winner? Is Soundhorn going to be eventual winner? Or is Palantir going to be eventual winner? And then we have to differentiate between the businesses that will win versus the sector that is going to grow. And, and that is why I'm, I'm being a bit cautious. It, yeah, this is not .com. This is AI. And this could go for another year, two years. Who knows? So I'm not, I'm not chasing it. Uh, Bobby said the Chinese stocks are not doing great. Are they still too risky? So two ways to look at Bobby. Stock-wise, it could still be risky. Business-wise, if you pick individual uh, businesses, like I look at Baba, right? If Baba was incorporated in US and not a China, you know, the Wall Street will all be all over it. I don't think I have, I, I'm not brought up Baba for today's discussion, but uh, I looked at the results currently trading as seven times free cash flow. It is generating almost $30 billion of free cash flow and the stock valuation currently is what? 190 to $200 billion. We don't have any companies of such profile in, in US. So business-wise, it is great. Stock-wise, it is very risky because if I own BA, BA, what am I owning? I don't own any stake in the company. I own a stake in a whole in a in a, um, a shell company that is incorporated in Cayman Islands or whatever BVI or Dominican Republic, one of those tax havens. And if Chinese government uh, comes and says that the whole VIE structure is illegal, this idea goes to zero. Or C uh, the um, CCP comes and takes over BABA and say, you know what, we're going to nationalize it. The business might still be the great stock price could still go to zero. So, so I, I, and today I don't know how to put a value to that particular risk. So I hold Baba. I like the business in in terms of the the val from a, from a valuation perspective. I like where it is trading right now. But what I don't know, and I can't put a dollar amount on the risk because of the CCP. So I'm going to position size it accordingly, and I don't. I, I want to make sure that if it goes to zero, you know, I'm not hurt. So two different things. Great business like Baba is great business. Stock-wise, same risk applies to all the Chinese companies, right? even though they are great businesses. Um, any of the ADRs that we hold in China doesn't give us any operational say in the business and how the businesses are run. So it's a completely different structure. It's a VIE structure uh, than how the other ADRs trade uh, in US. Because China does not allow foreign holdings into uh, these companies. So, so the companies have figured a roundabout way of uh, raising uh, money from uh, foreign investors. <clears throat> uh, now the Chinese stocks are not doing great because uh, you know from an institutional investor they say China is uninvestable um, because of the the route in their property market. Evergrande has become bankrupt. Um, code has told them to you know wind off. Uh, and government has not come to protect any of the foreign institution investors. So a lot of uh, foreign investors, the big money manager got burnt in uh, Evergrande failures. Uh, they, are, they picked up their bonds of Evergrande, which were available, you know, very cheap. 
thinking that they'll get defaulted. But unlike uh, like U.S. markets, wherein foreign institution investors have some protections, code does protect them. Chinese courts and the Chinese businesses operate differently. They don't worry about protecting foreign institutions. So all the institutions that bought Evergrande bonds thinking they were getting 50 cents, you know, uh, they were paying 50 cents for a dollar. Now those 50 cents have become one cent. So a lot of big money manager got burned in China and they're like, we're not touching it right now. But is China going to disappear tomorrow? No. Is is it? But if U.S. and China conflict continues and, you know, for whatever reason, the U.S. says, you know, all the ADRs need to delist, we don't have any other option. So that's that's a big risk. Do I own any other Chinese stocks? Yes, I do. I own NEO. I own uh, uh, Xpeng. I own Li Auto. I own Baidu. I own Baba. I think that's that's my Chinese stocks. But again, position sizing is important. Don't own just because I own. Don't become bullish on Baba just because I am. I don't know how to put a risk on this on the on the seat. The the government risk. Uh, Hari says SMC has the AN system built on top of uh, NVIDIA chips. I understand that. Yeah, but then again, it's a you can't do, you can't get a similar kind of a leverage in business, what you can get by selling software, right? The marginal cost of developing a software is almost zero. And that is why the companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, right? Have a such huge, you know, gross margins and operating margins. Uh, look at 70% uh, gross margin, 45% operating margin. That's Microsoft. Right, let's look at Google. Sixty percent, fifty-six percent gross margin, almost thirty percent uh, operating margin. Um, Any other great software company? Let's look at Adobe. Eighty-five percent gross margin, thirty-five percent operating margin. Because the marginal cost of producing a software is is so uh, cheap, but SMCI doesn't produce. You know you, the the cost is high, so it's like right now. It's, I think is just riding on the coattails of AI. Is ARM ADR two? Uh, no, ARM is not an ADR, right? ARM. Uh, hold on, ARM is an ADR. But this this ADR would be different from uh, the China-based ADRs. But ARM is an ADR. All the foreign uh, companies, um, when they you know get IPO over here, uh, go through the ADR route. Okay. All right. So. Let's, uh, I see another comment. Uh, I think ours is the best meetup group on stock. Oh, I, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, if you get value from this meetup every week, I think that's, that's, that's my intent. Uh, my job is done. Uh, expect ARM to go further. I don't know, so let's look at ARM. What, what has ARM uh, done for, from a business perspective, I mean, how much did they grow and all this? Stuff? So let's uh, bring up ARM. Um, ARM. Because it has got only 10% float, I think it is, it is uh, foolhardy to do any kind of analysis and say, hey, whether the, where the stock will go. Because the float is so less that the emotions will just ride over any um, sound business-based decisions. There are not many shares around. So I don't even know what to say. So so look at, if you look at uh, quarterly, the revenue was up like 30%, 40% year over year. Net income is still down. Um, 
EPS is still down. I think if it might, might have been a guidance, they would they probably would have guided um, a much higher than what the state was expecting. And that is why uh, a, everyone is jumping onto it. And just because it's got only 10% of load. Um, so it was. Could go further higher? Sure. But if a realization set in and say, gosh, I don't think it deserves like 60% upside. Or the people that who could not ride the NVIDIA train, they're just thinking this will be the next NVIDIA and investing in it. Yeah, then it may continue. Right. Oh, look at this. Gross margin 95% because ARM just, what do the ARM do? They don't even, they just sell their uh, IP. They just they get license it. It's from licensing. Yeah. Sorry? Licensing. Right. Yeah, it's, they just get royalty. Right. So there is nice. no, there is no, not much cost of sale. That's why, like looking at gross margin, ninety six percent gross margin. But looks like they spend a lot of money in their uh, sales and marketing and all that stuff. So operating margin is really bad. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I can put any decent thoughts around what should happen to ARM stock right now. This is just a momentum stock, and if you know how to play momentum, maybe go along with it. Right. If you know when to get off the roller coaster before it crashes, go along with it. I don't know when will be the right time. So I don't even want to get onto the roller coaster right now. All right. Okay. First of all, congratulations to you all. You know, we hit the new all-time high in the markets. S&P 500 is above 5,000. So you... So all those who have been, you know, held around, stayed invested, you've gone through the pains of 2022, through the euphoria of 2023, and didn't sell everything thinking, oh, it's too much, too soon, too high. Uh, you're there to enjoy the gains of uh, 2024. So so market hit all-time high. Uh, that's That's great news. And I was just looking at going back to some of the targets that we had looked at. Uh, almost all the targets have already been been met. And we are, what, six weeks <laughs> into this year. And the yearly targets have all been met, right? The only thing that Deutsche Bank, BMO, and of course, the, the Uber bull, uh, Tom Lee, those three targets are still remaining. Uh, so that, you know, again, no, no, even these fund managers of the street don't know what the market's going to do, uh, but market is up how much uh, year to date. Uh, let's look at S SPY. We are up 6% year to date. Even if you do a linear uh, projection on it, this means are we going to be up almost 55%? Per the year, that seems to be too much. So my personal opinion, uh, and because that's how I'm positioning my portfolio is, I'm not going to chase the rally. Does that mean I'm going to you know, sell and get out of the market because it might cash tomorrow? I, I don't know. I'm not selling out, but I'm just not chasing it and just make sure that I have my deltas in check. Right now, my portfolio has got the, the, the trading portfolio because I, on the investment side, I, uh, you know, retirement, I don't do much of a uh, delta reduction, but my trading portfolio is at the lowest deltas that I can remember. Right. Uh, but it is still positive delta. I'm not, I'm not gone short or I, I don't think I ever had a short, gone short across the markets, but yeah, enjoy the gains, but uh I have in back of my mind, I'm ready if a market goes down. And if you guys recall, last week I shared the, the portfolio pizza. I'm waiting for cash to, to deploy the cash. Let the, let me get some opportunity. I'll be happy if uh, markets go a little down, man. I can buy some stocks that I have up to deploy the capital on. If not, yeah, I'll enjoy, enjoy the ride. Uh, such as the next milestone, 5,400. I mean, that's going to be, you're, you are even more bullish than uh, Tom Lee. Maybe you should go to CNBC. Uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, I don't know where the next, next uh, milestone would be anyway. 
is it recommended to invest in s and p 500 i won't touch the 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 401k investment the regular that regular investment should just continue if I were if, if I were you, I'm not gonna stop the regular two weekly bi weekly DCAing into the overall market. That investment I'll just continue. I'm not looking to invest for next one year. Now the bigger question is, do I want to deploy additional capital? Uh, no, no, I'm I'm holding uh, on the side, but not bringing in anything more than what I generally do on four hundred one k. That's my thought. You, you could do whatever you want to. But we haven't gone through this milestone, you know, without stepping over some bodies. And the not so great news for, for uh, I think, for Mike himself, but eventually the market is, market is brutal, right? Mike Wilson, we talked about Mike Wilson. We have discussed, you know, his position, uh, his um, positioning, or I would say his outlook towards the market. The most celebrated anal, uh, the the strategy officer of the street of twenty twenty two. He came on the top. The best voted strategist of twenty twenty two is now leaving the you know, investment firm on Morgan Stanley. Why? Because he was bearish of whole 2023. And we came and talked about Mike Wilson's uh, projections around how the markets would be. So for those who are new, Mike Wilson was the chief U.S. equity strategist of Morgan Stanley. He was chair of the firm's Global Investment Committee. He was the best strategist for 2023. Remain bearish through 2024. And his projection was keep mostly in cash or in 2023, if we want to invest, invest in healthcare, real estate, um, utilities. And I forgot the fourth one. Uh, and, 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 and those four sectors were the worst performing sectors. Morgan Stanley institutions, investors, or the pension funds, if they had followed and probably Obviously, if it is coming from your own chief investment strategies, the portfolio managers will follow it. Probably didn't make any money in 2023. And he's out. Right? Markets are brutal. Right? You're like in sales, there's a saying, you're only as good as your last quarter. Same is the case in the investing. You're only as good as your last call. Right? Now he's out. Whatever. They gave some nice reason. He, he would focus on, you know, institution investors but but everyone knows the street knows what the real story is right that he is he remained bearish in 2023 he's still bearish in 2024 but now he's been out so i'm just thinking does this tells us that maybe is it the top of the market similar stuff had happened in around 2000 uh, it wasn't morgan stanley it was merrill lynch one of a Merrill Lynch analyst, very celebrated analyst, and uh, and uh, I don't know whether he or she was bearish about the market, saying, "Oh, it's too much of a euphoria," and market kept going up in 1999, and then uh, I think it was he, and uh, he was forced to go out. Uh, he was let go. They brought in another one, and then the market crashed. So I don't know. Does this does Morgan Stanley firing, not firing, Morgan Stanley reshuffling Mike Wilson. Does this indicate top of the market? I don't know. Maybe it could be another signal. Right? Now everyone is thinking, gosh, market is going to go only one way. When everyone is on the one side of the boat, you know what happens to the boat. So, so he's been out. Take whatever signals you want to. But the people, those have been sitting on the sidelines. And the interesting part, looking at how much money is still in the money market funds. Despite the fact that market has gone up 26% in 2023, and it is up 6% in six weeks, there's $6 trillion uh, still sitting in the money market funds. I think that's the most we ever had. And uh, 
I don't know when these people start to get into FOMO on, oh gosh, we missed the whole rally. And it has been like equally, right? Maybe 60% or 55% uh, institutions and the rest is retail. $2.3 trillion of retail money is still sitting in the money market funds. At some part of our time, Maybe there will FOMO set in and this will start to get deployed. Maybe that will determine what the top is. But uh, there's a lot of uh, money on the sideline yet. Still there. Uh, Sam says medical machines, auto parts survive recessions. Let's talk about, depends on which medical machines are we talking about, what company are we talking about. Healthcare was, uh, was the, one of the worst performing sectors in 2023. It, uh, and we say healthcare is a recession proof. Yeah, generally it is. Uh, if, if if a recession will set in, I think that companies of healthcare, utilities, consumer staples, because we'll still eat food, we will still pay our bills, and we will still do, uh, we will still go and, and, you know, take care of our health. Again, some portions of healthcare, like your elective procedures in a healthcare, uh, will have, will may not do as good. Uh, but so you, if you're looking at a healthcare, either you buy a healthcare ETF, if you look at individual companies, then you really need to focus on which individual companies do you want to uh, pick up in healthcare, right? Uh, look at a genomics. Uh, who was I talking to? Uh, or maybe it was just on on Twitter. Uh, Invite, right? related to genomic uh, gene editing genomics field, even though FDA has approved uh, gene splicing and gene editing based treatment, uh, they approved in 2023, the stocks related to those, that field still haven't done good, right? CRISPR or Envite or Illumina haven't been great investments. So yeah, I'll be careful. Auto parts. Yeah, auto parts. Uh, I think one company which I like on auto parts is AutoZone. But just because they've bought back so much of our shares, even though the business hasn't grown, uh, the the EPS has grown because the CEO has been one of a great capital allocators of recent times. They've just been focused on buying back the stock. All right. Uh, we already talked about the wild times and things like these. You know, tell me that the roller coaster is on, right? You might see some other people talking about, you know, how to time the market, how to get onto these roller coasters and all this stuff, how you can look at getting, you know, 50%, 60% a day. Uh, I am not that kind of investor. So if you're looking to get that 50% pop, maybe look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at a bigger macro level, is a recession canceled? So I was looking at this interesting chart in the finance category, right? Google finance, not general. In the finance category, there is a more search for Taylor Swift. I think probably people are searching for how the how, how Taylor Swift's phenomena is gonna add to our economy. And it has added a couple of, a few billion dollars to US economy, right? Then the people who are searching for recession. Right? So, Looks like maybe we'll probably not have that hard landing. Maybe Fed has engineered soft landing. Maybe we will survive these, uh, you know, inflation can be brought down without uh, crippling the economy. Hasn't happened so far. Maybe this is the first time. Uh, we'll see. But it was interesting to see a lot of searches for Taylor Swift under the finance category. Right. Uh, so I know the a um, lot of, uh, we have a Super Bowl tomorrow and unfortunately I'll be traveling. I don't know why some of the school keep competitions on Sunday. We all hate it. Uh, but but the school coordinator has promised that they're going to live stream uh, the Super Bowl game. But I think there are a lot of bets being placed, a lot of interest in Super Bowl from young ladies this time because of uh, Taylor Swift. 
So Taylor Swift being part of Super Bowl is going to add another a few billion dollars of uh, GDP related to to sports because a lot of those Swifties. My daughter, she calls herself as a Swiftie. She's a big fan of Taylor Swift. So a lot of Swifties are buying, you know, merch, NFL merch, which NFL had never seen that phenomenon before. Right. But because of Taylor Swift, this Super Bowl is going to be a little different. So <clears throat> uh, let's look at, is the window for hard lending or recession appears to be, seems to be closing down? Because as Fed become little, you know, uh, less restrictive. So obviously uh, no rate cuts in March. That's what Powell told. He also went and reiterated his thesis, same opinion in uh, on 60 minutes, right? But probably we're not gonna have a hard landing, but maybe a soft landing, maybe no landing. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we get a soft landing. So sleuths, right? Senior load officer opinion survey. Uh, the sleuth survey came out and based on that, uh, this is a chart which looks at how the banks are um, tightening the standards of lending. What percentage of banks are tightening those standards, right? So 2020, obviously, when the crash happened, every bank became like really uh, very focused on uh, on, you know, or became very focused on who they lent to. Then we got all the ZERP, a lot of money uh, put into the market or created out of thin air by Fed. Everyone become very complacent in on how they lend, including bank, including VCs, including the, the valuations that we saw, right? And then 2022 hit, everyone is cutting down. Now we are seeing bank, the percentage net respondents in terms of, the difference between those who are saying, oh, we are very restrictive versus those who are saying we're not, it's going coming down. Right? So maybe we could reach the bottom of the credit cycle, right? It's suggesting maybe the bottom of the credit cycle is in the rear view and uh, banks may be open to open up the credit for business and all that, and that will help economy. So even if the Fed stays restrictive, and uh, but the the banks are still open to give a credit that will avert any recession and all that stuff. Maybe then we'll have a soft landing. Right now, looking at a soft landing, there have been only it looks like only two periods of soft landing in the last sixty years: 1983, 84, 94, 95. They're not common, but there have been only two episodes. And there's an interesting chart of how the various asset categories have performed only the asset categories only in the stock, not other asset categories, how the various types of uh, stocks, et cetera, have performed during the soft landing. I don't know, are we going to achieve soft landing or not? But let's look at the numbers. 83, 84, uh, or let's look at the later one because this is more closer. Um, US, so prior, so after soft landing bonds were up obviously because if you're reducing the interest rates uh, then um, the bond prices will go up uh, high yield bonds 12 percent 19 percent 14 percent large cap stocks this is where i want to focus on is like 25 percent on an average international also did good mid cap small caps did probably the best that is why i think tom lee is beating the drum that 2020, 2024 is going to be the year of uh, small caps slash mid caps. Again, I'm not Tom Lee. If you, if you have a faith in Tom Lee, he proved himself right in 2023. He was wrong in 2022. So you are only good. So this year, everyone is have put Tom Lee on pedestal and thinking whatever he says is going to be, is the gospel. He's bullish on the, on the, sm on the, medium and small, right? Russell 2000. Uh, and if Fed start to cut interest rates, those are the businesses that perform the best because those are the businesses that need loan the most. You know, Google doesn't need uh, any credit. 
Apple doesn't need much credit. You know, Google has got more cash on its balance sheet than it has got debt. They raise debt because, hey, they can raise it cheaply. Not that they really need it. Who needs really is other small businesses. So when interest rates will go higher, we will see a lot of weakness in, uh, in small and medium business because many of them will actually go bankrupt, right? Or they can't uh, raise funds to run their operations. And if the interest rates cut down, we see comparatively the small and medium uh, businesses, they perform better comparative to the large cap stocks, right? So, it's, <clears throat> so that's what Tom Lee thesis is based on. Uh, so, so if we don't enter into recession, then yes, you know, ec economics suggests, history suggests that the small and medium business segments and hence the stocks should do better than the large cap ones. Right? If we don't enter into recession. If we enter into recession, these are the worst one to get hit first and, uh, and, and you know, go out of business. But interesting chart. Uh, weekly market stats, uh, yeah, S&P is up. I, I think this is only till Thursday. So it's up like 5%. NASDAQ is up 6.5%. Okay. Uh, and after being up, what, 30%? NASDAQ was up, what, 40, 45% last year? Okay. And this year it is up like 6.5%. Crazy, crazy times. I uh, there was another comment on bonds. Let me go back. I I remember seeing from the you know from my oh yeah Bobby asked how about bonds are they still bad investment? Uh, if the interest rates start to cut down, then the bond prices will rise. Now the problem is market is market had to at the start of the year. Market had factored in seven price cuts. Now it is six. Now I think it is after Fed told, uh -oh, forget about it, dude. Let me do my work. And that's what Jerome Powell was like, let me do my work. Right? And I'm not going to give you any interest rate cuts. We're not even talking about interest rate cuts in March. Right? Then maybe we're going to get the first one in May. And maybe a couple of them, you know, before elections. So now what, only four? I don't know. So let's, let me just see if I can put the, that Fed, uh, CME Fed Watch and see what's the market is now pricing in. So if we don't get the the rate cuts as uh to, 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 to get probabilities. Uh, let's Ooh, so now looks like so earlier the like a fifty percent were expecting rate cut. Now eighty five percent assume that the market eighty five percent of the market says no rate cuts. Now the May is only now fifty percent. So and then what? So we'll coming at one rate cut. No rate cuts uh, here. What two three? So one, two, then three, four, five. Yeah, but the percentages are so low. So, so yeah, market is slowly trying to understand what Fed is saying. And uh, currently, even for the May, it's like more than 50% says that we no longer get 25 basis point rate cut. And these things will change based on whatever, you know, daily basis, whatever Fed says. But yeah, if you don't get a rate cuts, then the bonds won't perform. And uh, longer the duration of the bond, more will be the impact on of the interest rates. Right. So, so start of a year, uh, uh, sorry, uh, starting for last year when we started assuming that, yeah, Fed is going to cut interest rates. That's why the stocks went up high. Uh, you remember October? When we started thinking, yeah, we're going to get interest rate cuts and stocks, like the October was uh, was the bottom, and we see huge jump in the stocks, and the bonds also went high because we're gonna get interest rate cuts. And now this week, all the bonds are sold off because ah, Fed is saying probably not anytime soon. So it depends on interest rate scenarios. All right, what else? Uh, 
So weekly performance, and this is like, oh man, crazy. NVIDIA, nine, <laughs> it's up 9%. And I don't know, you know, look at it. You guys, if you guys know me, I've been like, ah, that's too much. Hey. I thought seven, so uh, I think I'll, I'll, I have a no down. So I sold off another little bit of NVIDIA uh, this week. And it, I think I sold at 695. So that's my uh, next tranche of selling. I'm like, oh gosh, it's, I just can't justify it. But the craziness can continue. So I still hold it. I'm not completely out of my position, but I have no complaints. Right? So this this beast continues to go up. It, it's just going up in one direction. And I think it goes up until it stops going up. So we'll see. Uh, and it's up like another 9% for the week. Uh, what else? Google is up 5%. Uh, Eli Lili. I think there, these are the, there, there are only two themes that is working in the market right now. Weight loss and AI. And nothing else is working. And for year to date, yeah, NVIDIA is up like... <laughs> 45 percent this is on top of uh sorry i <laughs> i don't know and this is on top of what 230 240 percent of last year up another 45 percent we're not talking about a you know a small uh size market cap company we're talking about a company that is already a trillion dollar and it's going up another 10% per week. Oh, gosh. I just can't wrap my head around it. Uh, Amazon is up 15%. Uh, we reviewed uh, Amazon results uh, last week. So I'm not surprised. Meta up 32%. Uh, obviously, Meta revenue was up 25%. So some of that is justified. Uh, Li Lilly is up 27%. Uh, and Tesla is down 22%. It, Tesla is even worse than Boeing, to come to think of it. <clears throat> what, 20, 45% NVIDIA? Uh, call me skeptic, but, uh, you know, I want to, I think this is one situation where I can say I have my cake and eat it too. Uh, I sold my position, uh, some position on NVIDIA and still hold something. So if it comes down, I'm like, I do, I sold it. And it continues to go up, I hold still a little bit of it. So looking at a fear and greed index, uh, that's why it's time to be cautious. When everyone is bullish, maybe time to stay back, you know, take a step back. I'm not saying Mark's gonna crash, but Hey guys, I don't uh, have to ride with everyone else. Sorry, someone had a comment. Yeah, Alibaba in Hong Kong is still going down. Yeah, we talked uh, Alibaba, no, right? No, so excuse me. I'm responding to you when people are fearful. I mean, I I think it's below. Uh, it's a uh, ten year ten year. This is Hong Kong. This is not the U.S. Well, uh, by the way, I, I did buy uh, uh, like 400 shares of BABF last weekend. And it, it was not cheap. I bought it close to $10, you know, which was okay. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's one of these. Well, I'm not smart like you. I can't uh, sell a stock. And, oh, it doesn't have options, but I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, yeah, I just wanted to comment that. Uh, Alibaba's still going down in Hong Kong. Um, you know, it's been going down uh, since I think uh, August 2021. That's when I started buying options. Okay, later. China's index. So let's look at China's FX. Right now, you know, a lot of institution is leaving, uh, getting or getting out of China. Look at FXI. Forget about Baba. This is like large cap. China ETF, right? It's been on a downtrend for for almost three years, right? The people think China is dead. It's done. It's dusted. So much of a pessimism is in China, and some it's for the right reason also because U.S. reopened, economy jumped. China reopening didn't work out. When China reopened. 
there was a you know spike over here thinking oh my god now china is reopening we may see the similar stuff what we saw in us but no the property so uh, again the dynamics are different in us and china us most of the wealth is created in the stock market and then uh, of course there there is a in, in the property market also countries because us capital market is so strong right countries especially that are not don't have as big advanced capital markets countries like Ch china india right most of the wealth or the majority of the investors will in invest in property market not in the stock market right of course india is now starting to change slowly uh, and in the u and in china the property markets are in shambles we already saw evergrande going bankrupt then that means a lot of investors have lost a lot of their money. And even if the Chinese government come to protection, they don't come to protection of equity holders. They would rather try to protect the bond holders first rather than the equity holders. So there is a different dynamics. Uh, it's all because of the, the, the rout in the property market in China that we are seeing uh, the GDP is down. Uh, town means it's not growing. It's probably the GDP growth is the is the lowest we have seen in years in China. The the job market is is bad in China. Um, people are um, you know the the pessimism the among consumers is at its peak in China. So so that is why. Not just the Baba or anyone all. I mean, there's so much of pessimism in China. And sometimes in this pessimism, the stock get punished more than the business could be. Right? I'm not saying that the, the economy is doing great and the stocks are being punished. Stocks are being punished more than the what the, the business has been. And that's where the alpha could be. That's, that's a difference. So looking at, let's say, Baba, business has... Yeah, it's not done as great as what it used to be, you know, the growth used to be uh, uh, five years ago. But the stock has even done worse than the business. Right? So so that's the difference. Asif is surprising that, that about NVIDIA that the volume seems to be even higher than 2021, 20, 20. Is the volume or vol? Volatility. NVIDIA. No, of all these, okay, 45% and all that. Oh, volume. Yeah, I haven't been, uh, so let's look at, let's look at uh, what, three years, two, 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 two. where do we go to three years? I am on three years. No, it seems to be the, the blue bar uh, represents volume. Yeah, the volume started to pick up on an average. The volume has been higher from 2021 onwards. Uh, Coupang is being hit too. Yeah, Coupang, I, I think they're going to report the results. Uh, when is when is CPNG reporting results? CPNG. They're reporting on 27th. So yeah, there's still a, a couple of weeks away. So I Coupang got hit in 2022 along with all other unprofitable companies. But then the management is now focused on generating more, growing responsibly. So probably, you know, they may turn around. Well, who knows? They they are in, Coupang is, not a, is in a, a big business, kind of a, the business that they are in will take a decade to play out, right? You have to build up the whole supply chain, uh, uh, in, uh, your delivery infrastructure in Korea. Now they're moving into uh, Taiwan, and they've seen some good things in Taiwan, but let's save the discussion after they report the results. I'm still holding coupon. But it's a, it's a decade play. You don't get, you don't build e-commerce companies uh, over a few years, right? It's a, it's a long shot. So we'll see. All right, what other earnings are coming up next week and what I'm gonna watch? Uh, Arista? I mean, when I look at the research numbers, I mean, that's so great. I don't own this company, but I always think, oh, why don't why don't I own this yet? So I want to see how many uh, 
you know how how Arista does this uh, this quarter. Teradata uh, came onto my radar. I think I read about Teradata maybe in Barron's, maybe in Bloomberg, around some mid cap could be a mid cap AI play. Uh, uh, because again, data storage, uh, you need to run your AI models and all that. You need data storage and Teradata. So I just want to see how they're reporting. Shopify, uh, obviously, Shopify had some nice jump this week uh, because they raised the pricing. Uh, Airbnb, Robinhood. Uh, more on our sentiments of uh, around crypto and what the retail investors do. Uh, Instacart, uh, they compete against Uber. Uh, Coinbase, see what the crypto sentiments gonna do with them. Trade Desk, uh, DoorDash, Toast. I don't own Toast. I don't own DoorDash. Uh, but we'll see. Um, Cisco. Uh, is reporting next week, but this I think yesterday, the kind of a probably maybe it's an attempt to assuage the fear of investors. They reported huge layoffs. I don't I don't think we have the numbers, but they hinted that it's going to be huge next round of a huge layoffs coming from uh, uh, Cisco again to to make it more profitable as a company. So we'll see how that impacts what they have to say uh, in the earnings call. Yeah, still a lot of earnings still coming up. I mean, still a lot of uh, tech companies. Uh, Lyft, uh, it's like a tale of two two businesses, Lyft and Uber. Kind of both started to almost together. And now one is, Uber is what? 150 billion? Uber, what's Uber latest market cap? Uh yeah, hundred and almost hundred and fifty billion dollars in lift. I guess it's less than ten billion dollars. Oh, it's a half of that. It's like five billion dollar. Right. So, yeah, it's a it's a different economy. Economics. Right? It's it's a scale problem. In delivery, is just a scale business, nothing else. And lift just got run over by uber so doesn't mean same business uh similar same business segment to completely different companies if you want to pick you need to know how to pick these winners all right uh buys and sells this week for me uh i bought a little bit of a tesla uh it was like close to 185 or something i think that's maybe i picked a little bit more and uh yeah, I feel much better rather than picking at 250. I think 185 is better. And I picked a little bit of uh, Adyen. And like I sold, uh, told earlier, I sold a little bit of uh, NVIDIA. So I am out of two third of my position in NVIDIA um, right now. And I'm holding one third. Probably I'll sell some portion of that one third. Maybe when NVIDIA goes $900. But uh, I'll hold until then. You know. Again, this is my, what you call as a schmuck insurance. That NVIDIA goes to 2000 in the two months. I don't want to be looking just like a schmuck that I sold everything. This is my schmuck insurance. Right? I think I feel crazy that NVIDIA is, I still feel NVIDIA is right now is too overvalued. But uh, that's why this is my schmuck insurance. Uh, Sifa, do you know of any website that tracks the history of institutional investors, percent and number? I believe it does, but charges a lot. Not on top of my head. I don't know if Guru Focus, they do provide uh, which institutions hold what. Uh, did you look at that? Maybe that'll have it, but not something that I, you know, try to find it. Actively, so I'm don't I'm not actually sort <clears throat> behind you know after this information, so, so I have no idea. A current holdings is available. Okay, Guru Focus. So yeah, what else? Then other only other thing I have is got a lot of earnings to go through. IBD uses percent increase over period as signal to build a new position. 
Maybe if you, yeah, that could be one of a signal to see which institutions are buying or selling it. But sometimes institutions are also late to the game. Uh, and majority of the time, as in institution chasing the price, start, <laughs> chasing the price, uh, not the other way around. The more and more, you know, I look at a market, it looks like I used to, I used to think, uh, you know, that some of these analysts and, uh, and the, and the so-called smart money is actually really smart. But after being actively looking at the markets on the, uh, nah, everyone is, even they are chasing prices. Very few of them actually do, uh, do better research. I think I find more individual investors doing uh, more research than the analysts they'll just are chasing prices. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, may not be a leading but lagging signal. Okay, uh, but yeah, you know, momentum works. There's a momentum investing is a type of investing, right? So if you want to uh, burn momentum investing, yeah, that's okay. You know, some investors are very successful in momentum investing. All right, time to get into earnings. Maybe we'll spend 45 minutes on earnings. 30, 45 minutes. Uh, unless there are some other questions. All right, uh, so a couple of them are spillover from our previous session, which is Microsoft and Google. So let's finish the spillover. Let's look at Microsoft. And again, I'll probably run through it. If any questions, think, or if you want to, even if not related to earning some other company, just put it in the chat. But otherwise, I'm just going to go with this particular this agenda of going through all these earnings. All right. So let's look at Microsoft. So Microsoft earnings is one of the most difficult one. The second difficult one is an Apple one to, to you know, segment and understand it because Microsoft reports, the way Microsoft reports the numbers, they're all like jumbled together. If I were to find out how much did they do in particularly in Azure, it's like you have to go through a few different numbers. Anyway, so Microsoft report uh, its results under three main business segments, productivity, business processes, which includes office commercial products and its cloud services like your Microsoft Office desktop plus Office 365, uh, commercial products, consumer products, LinkedIn, Dynamic products and Dynamics cloud services, right? Dynamics kind of a their ERP kind of a product. Other business segment is intelligent cloud, which includes the server products. I get this includes the SQL server and stuff like that. And cloud services, which is Azure and some other cloud services also. So earlier you used to think, you know, leaking the intelligent cloud means that's my Azure, but then I realized, oh, that's not Azure. Then there's a third segment is more personal computing, which includes your Windows, then window commercial product, and the cloud services. So, you know, cloud is everywhere in all the three segments. And then of course the devices, Xbox and uh, you no know, Bing and news advertising. So anyway, so looking at uh, uh, readable or is still an eye chart? Okay, cool. All right, so, so revenue growth up 18% year over year, 70% uh, almost 70% gross margin, operating income up 33%, right? Year over year, 44% uh, operating margin, net income up 33%, free cash flow, $9 billion of free cash flow. I mean, there's nothing not to like. Uh, let's go down. Maybe there is something which not to like, probably I mentioned it here already. So, Revenue to $62 billion, talked about gross margin, net income. They had an increase in CapEx. Yeah, CapEx is is up from uh, $6.2 billion in Q4 of last year to $9.7 billion. That means it's up 55%, which I'm not mad at them. 
hey, you need more AI workloads and you know you need to increase your CapEx to support it. So which is good, those chips and servers, they do cost a lot. And that's why we're seeing Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, they're all ordering chips from uh, NVIDIA. Uh, balancing long-term liabilities over $100 billion. So it's not that um, they don't have a debt, but these are the debt that they have raised at a very cheap um, a cost so more than hundred billion dollar, but they still have a lot of they generate a lot of cash anyway. So the interest coverage ratio more than thirty x, so not an issue. Uh, free cash flow dropped because of uh, the investments, right? So and uh, there's a decrease of twelve billion dollar under receivables. So that's a but not big concern. Trend wise, all look good. Now come to the main how the business has done. Those, those so looking at overall crowd grew thirty grew twenty four percent, which is their overall. Uh, it's not even intelligent cloud, right? So this is overall cloud. Is this your Azure Office three sixty five? Everything cloud grew twenty four percent. The Azure part grew. 30%, so which is great. Looking at AWS, last week we looked at Amazon. Amazon grew 13%. Google grew at 26%. Azure is actually growing faster than Google. Of course, Azure growth year over year has come down, which is, hey, that's how the businesses are run. The bigger you become, the slower will be the growth, but growth has re-accelerated in last, I would say four, three, four quarters, because if you go back and look at it, like, so this is 2024, this is so this is 2023, this is 2024, four quarters are 20, ah, what am I saying? This is 2023, this is 2022. So 2022, efficiency, 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 everyone was cutting cost, so obviously, what's called a rationalization or optimization every customer is doing. So we saw the growth going down. This is the AI pickup in 2023. We are seeing growth going to AI, right? <clears throat> what else? Uh, shareholder friendly measure, they returned $8.4 billion in dividend and buybacks uh, and almost no share dilution. So whatever they paid as a stock-based compensation, company bought back. So we are not, as a shareholder, I'm not diluted. Looking at the call highlights, commercial bookings, booking at the demand were better than expected. Again, because of long-term Azure contracts. Microsoft has taken arguably the most aggressive and direct approach to monetizing generative AI, right? It's not using it AI just to make existing product better, but is bundling it all of the new utility to new subscriptions in the software that is gonna upsell why it's Copilot offering, right? So Copilot was first integrated to, into GitHub. GitHub was a company that Microsoft bought and is quickly making it way into rest of the product suite. So you'll be upsold. What it costs, what, 20 bucks per month? That's what the pricing was for uh, Copilot. Uh, and you'll now start seeing if, you know, it coming into your Word, your Outlook, your presentation, it could actually go and you can say, you know, I want to do a, let's say I want to do my board of director presentation. Uh, I could look at all the data and maybe generate it some a basic one for you. Generative AI has added 600 bips to Azure growth for this quarter. So out of, uh, that means Azure grew 30%, 6% came from generative AI. Uh, and uh, what else? Another important thing is they put together to create a small sized, to, to put a team which will be cheaper than using chat GPT. Chat GPT is expensive. Now, if I'm a business, I don't want to pay for the high cost. So Microsoft probably is creating a separate, you know, a different AI system, which will be cheaper than paying through chat GPT. GitHub revenue accelerated 
because of co-pilot adoption. So that also makes us a little bullish on once the co-pilot is rolled onto other services, maybe they will upsell nicely. Right. So anyway, so that's on uh, Microsoft. Well, Microsoft also hit a new all-time high uh, in the last two weeks. So if you're Microsoft shareholders, congratulations. You've done well. All right, uh, I see comment. I hold uh, WM. That's uh, waste management, I guess. What is WM? Yes, it is waste management. Uh, again, this is one of those companies, right? Uh, kind of a, almost recession proof. Probably won't grow it at like 60%, 20%, 60%, 70%, but will chug along nicely. Will I guess this company generates some decent cash flow also. But the business seems to be pretty stable business. Uh, RSG is also good to look at. What is RSG, uh, shop, TTD. I think I'm going to talk about shop as well as TTD maybe next time because both are going to report the results and I own both. DE, I guess that's dear. I don't own that. What is RSG? Oh, is a, this seems to, this probably is in the similar business, waste management, Republic services. Yeah. So, uh, and then these are called, uh, so called like, like ugly businesses, but beautiful stocks, right? <laughs> you, you All you're doing is handling trash. No one wants to do that. It's a dirty business, not say ugly, it's a dirty business, uh, but uh, beautiful stocks. Uh, you don't always, we don't always have to run behind the next shiny uh, star in the market. Uh, some of these businesses are great. Trash is king, exactly. The another one which is on tra trash, I think I talked about this company earlier also, uh, but I still don't own it uh, because some something has to give up to, to start to own this is, is, is Copart. Right? Uh, again, done. It, it's, it's a great business. I, I want to read the book uh, by the Copart uh, founder. I think what it's called, Trash is Gold or something like that. And, and they do... Basically, all the cars that we send to junkyards, Copart manages, uh, you know, selling that insurance and all that stuff. It's a great business. Huge moat around their business. The, does it, does it, you know, grow at 40%, 50% like AI companies are? No. Right. But these are the businesses which are like over 20 year period become a great compounders. Uh, all right, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, Google. Ooh, Google. Uh, let's bring up Google for discussion. All right, overall revenue is up 13% to 80, $86 billion. It's like, uh, like 300... 20, 350 billion dollar run rate businesses, right? Cloud grew at 26% year over year. Uh, and this three over period is growing at 34%. So it's a, it's a third player behind AWS. But AWS is obviously is the, is the biggest one. Uh, its growth obviously can't grow at the same pace, but it is, uh, it's 18%. Then you got uh, Azure, which is growing at, we just looked at grew at 30%. Third is Google growing at 26%. Uh, and Google Cloud, now fourth consecutive quarter of operating profitability. So they have turned the corner around in terms of running the Google Cloud uh, operations profitability. Uh, profitable, right? You have to do investments when you're starting up especially huge CapEx will be required uh, when you're trying to set up uh, a cloud services. But now over the past four quarters, it's been operating profit. Thing to focus on Google is uh, their YouTube, right? 
and we've been talking about it now for almost two years. Keep an eye on YouTube. YouTube has now become almost 36 billion, $38 billion, or, or sorry, $37 billion uh, run rate business, growing at 16%, right? <clears throat> Back in a growth mode starting this year and is like delivered about $9.2 billion. And how much revenue Netflix makes? Uh, and FLX. So Netflix, let's look at $33 billion annual sales. So, so, so YouTube is actually, if you look at annual run rate, is as big as Netflix is, right? So this is one big Netflix hiding inside Google, right? uh, which if you split YouTube out of Google, that itself is like 250, more than $250 billion worth of business hiding inside it. Advertising, which is their main stay, is uh, they did $65 billion, which is up 11% year over year. There's a slight miss. Market was expecting 65 point something, and they did only 65. And then what happened? Uh, let's go to Google. Right. And because they slightly missed it, whatever algos and all that trashed the stock stock was down seven and a half percent right uh the next day the day after reporting earnings stock fell down because oh you missed the expectations but those are the times when and and i think i uh, last week i mentioned i bought some google oh, look at a business i'm like i don't think like a half a person miss means you lose one, you know, seven percent, one twelfth, or if your valuation doesn't, or whatever, one thirteenth, doesn't make sense. So these are like a short term uh, movements, uh, which provides an opportunity. If you know, you know, you understand the business, and you know that what the company has done as a business, and you know, whatever algos will sell off, depending on they read, they read that the analyst expectations have been missed out. Sell, 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 sell. Uh, so yeah, I don't see anything bad in uh, in, in this business. Right? It's chugging along nicely. Gross margins, profitability side, gross margin almost uh, 55%, operating margin 27%, $20 billion net income, growing EPS by 56%, $7 billion of free cash flow, $110 billion on their balance sheet, $37 billion long-term liabilities. They can return, you know, they can pay off their low, all their liabilities if they want to. They've got more than three times of the cash sitting on their balance sheet. But why? Probably they got much cheaper at a much cheaper rate, right? And like 22% return on invested capital. What's not to like? Now, free cash flow came down. Uh, where is it? Uh, okay, I don't have a year-to-year -year free cash flow, but I have a chart. So free cash flow came down, and which is fine. Same thing because now they invested into capex. So if you look at the capex, they invested eleven billion dollars into their capex, which is hey, if you want to make Gemini the the next frontier for AI and as good as your uh, Microsoft, you know, Open AI, you need to invest. So. Well, Microsoft spent it and Alphabet is also doing it. So I'm fine with, you know, free cash flow going down. Uh, what else? Long-term liability is coming down. They got a strong balance sheet and they've been reducing the share count. Right. Now, one thing to note was net income. So if you look at their net income, some of the net income was held by change in accounting for their useful life of servers and network equipment. Google does it every, if not every quarter, almost every other quarter, I'll see it that they keep on change. And this is why I want to focus on operating margins and operating profitability rather than just the net profits, right? Uh, because you can game the net profits. 
So you can change how you want to uh, account for depreciation. And in this case, it helped a little bit. So you have a, if you want to look through the details, the provided details of you know, how much the impact was. So key takeaways from the earnings call. Four areas which Google want to focus on. Uh, investments in AI and how it is helping search. So they're going to go to Gemini Ultra. So if you recall the coverage of Gemini, they go, Gemini got a multiple form factor, Gemini Nano, Gemini Pro, Gemini Ultra. Uh, subscriptions have reached, subscription revenue is $15 billion, which includes all your uh, you know, YouTube and other subscriptions. Cloud crossed $8 billion by, driven by Gen AI. And they got a two Vertex AI plus this. YouTube premium and music has got 100 million subscribers. Netflix has got 260 million subscribers. And with the 100 million subscribers, it is already doing annual run rate of the same business as what Netflix is doing. So investment and focus to meet growth and opportunities in AI. So expect some more CapEx. Waymo had reached 1 million, 1 million fully autonomous ride hailing trips. And, and these, and these, I would say these are just the Google other bets, right? Waymo doesn't work. I'm not bothered. The isomorphic labs and the partnership with Eli Lilly doesn't work. I'm not bothered. But if the one of these become, you know, actually become the real business, that could be another 50 to hundred billion dollar business once it come out of these, uh, they are Google labs. Right? So, but anyway, stock was down uh, just because, you know, barely they missed the expectations. So that's, that's Google. Uh, Ramesh just said, Bezos sold $2 billion of Amazon and the stock goes up. Uh, Amazon has been on tear uh, this week. So any questions on Google? So let's move to the next one otherwise. How are we doing on time? 11.33, I think we have time. Let's talk about Palantir. So uh, I think, I don't know, is it time to take a victory lap? So Palantir, we first time talked about Palantir in last February. Right? Probably not the first time. I can, this was the second time Maybe I talked about it the first time in two, when it came IPO, right? I think I reviewed IPO of Palantir. Then next time, second time we talked about was in February, session 162, you can go and view the recording. And I said, dude, that's $6.20. Doesn't make sense to me. And we basically all we did was a review that's 2022 business update and what the company is doing and that, and the reason why I keep notes is I can go back and refer and say, hey, what did I say at that time? Is business working out at that way or not? So going back a year ago, January 2023, my sentiment was bullish. Stock was 620. I'm like, I'm bullish at this price point. It has a mode in the business, added more to my position. We'll watch for these two things in future. Stock-based compensation, you know, how much, because one of the issue with the Palantir has always been they're diluting too much shareholders uh, by issuing too much of a stock-based compensation. Second thing I want to watch is a commercial revenue percent. How much are they able to grow the revenue from their commercial business? Not the government one, but the commercial business. Because if we are selling only to government, you're going to get priced or the valued as a government contractor, not as a software company. So I want to focus on the commercial revenue percent. Current tailwinds, Fear mongering due to war and its strength in AI. Right. So, so that was first time introduced. Then I think we did a, another, and they actually introduced their AI in mid of April. So we reviewed their AIP platform. Then July I talked about when the street started talking about its AI, saying, hey, Palantir has got AI. Then we did a company update on September. Then finally in November, we reviewed the, um, when I was reviewing a lot of stocks saying, maybe this is a story that flew under the radar around this one. So now we're back to Palantir. Now the reported results. 
Uh, so let's see what the results have been have done. And then stock will talk later, but let's talk about the business. That's why it pays to keep an eye on business. And uh, and one thing uh, which at least I became more educated is the importance of doing an initial position. So when I didn't buy Palantir first time at $6.20. My first purchase on Palantir was at $24 or $25 in whatever, 2021 and all that stuff, right? But I did the initial purchase because I'm like, it sounds like an interesting company. Because the software is building this platform, it's not a startup, it's been there around for 17 years, 18 years. So I want to keep this on my radar. I picked up initial shares. If I had not picked it up, then I wouldn't have looked at it in January when I was trading at six bucks. Or the it's down to six bucks. What the heck has happened? How would the business has gone so bad? And that's when when I looked at looked at business. So that is why I'm saying if companies you if you find that the company is interesting, maybe do a small position, right? Uh, similar thing we did on Adyen. Started did a small position, then waited, did more in you know deep dive, and then say okay maybe you know then I'll increase the position. So they reported results. Uh, let's look at the headline numbers. Uh, revenue is up 20% year over year to $608 million. Operating margin is 11%. I want to talk about this one. Uh, net in, Now they are gap profitable. So this company has never been gap profitable except for last five quarters uh, because, oh, you know, whole 2023 was uh become profitable become profitable become profitable right so so they turned around and became gap profitable again bigger question is hey you can game the gap but one reason is that to get included into s p 500 you have to have a continuous four quarters of gap profitability so even if they're gaming the system i think they're focused on hey let's let's show profitability what i like is operating cash flow you can't you can gain your net uh, income, you can't game your cash flows, right? So $301 billion of operating cash flow. I like it up almost, <laughs> if you really look at it, the, all these numbers, like net income up 200%, operating cash flow is up 282%, EPS is up 300%, free cash flow is up 300%. You know, uh, that's, and the street went crazy. I think the stock was up like 30, 40% after that. Now so let's look at the things that I wanted to focus on. Commercial revenue. So overall revenue grew 20%. That's fine. How much did they grow the commercial revenue? Up 32%. And government revenue grew 11%. So that is much, at a much higher pace. Commercial revenue is at a much higher pace than the government revenue. That means the street will start looking at this company not as Booz Allen Hamilton, not as other government contractors, but as a commercial, a vendor of a commercial software like Microsoft's, like Google's of the world. That's, that's where the lot of valuation, you know, the what do you call, the resetting of the valuation or the multiples will happen. If this company can show to the world that, I can sell it successfully to the commercial customer. Now, how many government customers are you going to have? They're, they're not going to sell to China anyway. This is one company which is like focused on Western companies and the Western uh, countries' values. And uh, so you suddenly run out of the governments to sell to. But if you are a commercial software vendor, you can sell it to hundreds and thousands of com companies around the world. But then your software need to do you know, uh, to be useful in the commercial uh, space. So good to see that the commercial revenue is growing faster. Other thing is billings is up 56%. So while the revenue for this quarter was up 20%, 56% uptick in billings means, so the billings is what get converted into revenues, right? So this is like kind of a contracts I've signed, but because I haven't delivered the services yet, I can't I can't recognize that as a revenue. 
But as and when I'm going to deliver the service, I will get that revenue. So if I'm seeing 56% growth in billings, means customers are signed a contract and the does everyone understand the difference between billing and revenue? Or I'm going, going go, getting too deep. All right, let me let me say it for this because you will see this in all the software company, and it's an important metric to look at. If as a company, I signed a contract with a customer ABC, and the contract is for five hundred dollars for a services for a length of five years. So I will show that the billing is 500. And for the next quarter, assume that the service is at a consistent rate. I'm going to recognize $100 as a revenue because $100 in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, I'm going to provide the service. It's only when I provide the service, I can recognize the revenue. That's how the accounting will work. You know, I've gone through this all my life because we were responsible for revenue. So even though the contract, I have to tell how much revenue finance you can recognize this year, right? Because that's depending on how much services we've given to customers. Uh, so, but the fact that 56% growth in revenue means if they don't goof up, sorry, 56% growth in billings means if they don't goof up, that's going to get converted to revenue over a period of time, right? So that's the important metric. And I really like that one. Customer count is up 35% and a commercial customer count is up 44%. So net net, last year when I said, I want to watch how they're growing commercial on the commercial uh, side of the house, they're done good. Right? Average revenue per top 20 customers is $55 million. Right? And of course, Palantir doesn't, the software is not cheap. So it's not, I mean, it's pretty expensive looking at like $55 million average revenue, uh, top 20. So, and, and there are some deals they have, which is above $25 million. More than a million dollar deals, 103, which is up 87% year over year, right? So these are not like smaller ones, like million dollar, more than million dollar deals are up 87%. So good stuff. Re uh, revenue up 20%, gross margin highest of any quarter, net income highest of any quarter. We looked at all that. Share based compensation down 93%. Right? My second pet peeve was the diluting shareholders, they need to fix that. So they're doing it. I'm not sure that, I don't think that they have actually, you know, at a level where I feel comfortable. But they are on the path. Business metrics, commercial grew. We talked about it. Billing, we talked about it. Uh, I think we talked about all of them. Not so good, right? I think operating margin sucks. You know, this is one area where I'm a little doubtful about it. Dude, is it really a software company? Why is the fact that if you look at their gross margins are 82%? And operating margins is like 11%, 12%, whatever. What was the operating margin is, yeah, 10.82%, right? Uh, so I'm like, look at Microsoft, 45%, 30%. So this tells me that either the software, they have to spend a lot on either on their sales and marketing or the software is not mature enough that you have to keep investing in R&D and hence your operating expenses are so high. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can look at their income statement and see where they're spending more. But in either case, I really want to keep an eye because if the operating margin is still low, then it becomes more like every time you sell a software, you have to also send an engineer over to this. So become more of a customization, a lot of customizations required uh, into the software, then you're not going to get the same valuation, which you probably get a valuation of a, of a tech consulting company, like Accenture's of the world, but not like Google's of the world. Something that I want to keep an eye on. Number two is on the similar line. They need to have, like, they're holding a lot of a working capital to generate very less operating income, right? So this is, this guzzles a lot of capital. 
to generate a lot of to generate you know comparatively it generates lesser revenue as compared to amount of capital that it is consuming so while the street is all celebrating it like 30 percent upon all that these are the things that i want to focus on and third is share dilution is down but uh you know uh, previous quarters ideally i want it to be less than four percent or two percent five percent i think right now they are still diluting shareholders oh, uh, gosh i don't have the deal uh yeah they increase the shareholders uh yeah by 13 percent shares are up by 13 percent so dilution is 13 percent which is bad right they've done a good job so far i mean they, they've been right trajectory not where i want it to be so these are not so good i don't think i found anything else overall trend wise i think otherwise it's all okay so buybacks, no additional update. They have previously mentioned they'll do a billion dollar buyback. I hope that they don't do it now. They do it when the stock is punished. Um, what else I saw? They introduced a new product called Mission Manager. It makes me bullish on this one. Uh, this will basically help the governments to look at all the vendors in single platform. Uh, management talked about benefits of AIP. It once took two week, uh, took weeks and months, if not longer, for data integration and platform to be integrated with customer systems. AIP can be up and running in a few hours. And if you look at the demos uh, of uh, AIP, those are simply mind blowing. Now, coming from the similar space, I'm like, how can they even do this? I hope those demos are not doctored ones, <laughs> not like Gemini ones. Uh, but uh, if the if, if the product is actually as good as what they are showing in a demo, and uh, if the strength that they are seeing in their AIP and through boot camps, and it's going to be a winner. Right? Uh, this is what the CEO had to say in the call saying, we already have too many customers than we can handle. We don't know how to deal with the demand from our prospective customers. They don't have a much bigger of a sales force to sell to those customers. Uh, other thing is the government is moving the spend from hardware to software, which is called primes are the, the big government contractors like Lockheed Martin, um, your Raytheons, those are called primes. So the if you go and look into the what primes had to say during their quarterly calls, and some of those primes got punished, is government is changing a strategy. They're focusing a lot more on software. So primes are saying we have to invest more into the software side. And which, when I'm looking at Palantir like, has been software-based defense tech company right from day one. So they are perfectly positioned to take advantage of this tailwind of the change in the government strategy of trying to spend more on software, right? Obviously, you need the hardware, you need the choppers, you need missiles, you need the tanks and all that stuff. Government also realizes to win the wars of the next century, we need to invest a lot in our software also. And primes who historically have a huge strength on the manufacturing side, don't have the same strength on the software side. So, but Palantir has been for now 20 years, focused only on the software uh, from for defense stuff. So that's a tailwind. Other thing I like is the Fed start, <clears throat> uh, which is because the company, and they talked about uh, the, the this product, which allows the companies to be able to sell the softwares on the government product. So if you are want to sell a software to government, you need to have certain level of certifications, right? Basically, you need to have a FedRAM certification. So FedRAM certification, it's called a FedRAM. That itself will cost you a couple of million dollars to go through that certification. In one of my, uh, the, the previous startup that I was working on, we want you to do that. But then cost, cost us a couple of million dollars. We actually didn't go for it. And we didn't even pitch for the deals. We didn't want to pitch for the deals because we didn't have FedRAM certification, right? So we were kind of out of our deals for those. Now what Palantir has done, they have built a platform in which 
you don't have to go and get your own FedRAM certification. You can onboard your software onto Palantir software, which already comply and already FedRAM certified kind of a stuff, right? So, uh, so from that perspective, and now there's there's launching it for some, and this is like specifically they said uh, we're doing it for a secret and super secret networks, and eventually this will the headwind the tailwind from this is is going to help the all other startups so so far a lot of startups and uh, palantir were kind of uh, in conflict with each other because trying to build and sell the software to uh, you know to the government and competing with each other but if they can really pull this off you can get all those startups who are building great software on the palantir's fedramp certified platform fed they call it i think fed start and sell to, to government and they become, instead of being competing each other, they become basically allies. Right. So so I really like that. Let's see how that business works. This is, a, again, these two are new businesses, Fresh Start and Mission Manager. Uh, conclusion that, my conclusion was, hey, AIP is seeing demand from customers. The number of customers that have gone through AIP bootcamp has been growing every quarter after quarter. And, uh, so what I'm going to do is to increase my coffee can quantity by 20%. Again, start small. Let business prove that it is worthy of my money. And then I'm going to maybe add more money to this. So, so yeah, that's that's uh, Palantir. I hope uh, you paying attention to the business and maybe if you took exposure to it, it has worked out pretty well, right? Now what it's like. 25, 24 bucks. Yeah, 24. A street went crazy and I think the stock was up like 30% after earnings. So that is Palantir for you. Uh, Alfred, I'm mean, Alfredo, I'm totally blind option trader. Anyone know how a totally blind option could trade options? Sorry, Alfredo, I have no experience, nor do I know any of my friend who does it. If anyone else knows and can help out Alfredo, please. I'm assuming, uh, and probably that would be a bad assumption, is some of these brokerage platforms may be uh, certified for uh, disabilities. I think there's a WCAG now I don't even know what the compliance number 2.0. I worked on 2.0, uh, but that may help. But if those are not, um, I don't know how I can help. All right, uh, that's uh, any questions on Palantir? Yeah, so you, Alfredo, that's what I'm saying. You may have to look for, and I don't know what's the, comp so, these websites, if the government websites or the websites funded by government or the company that have received funding from government have to comply with, uh, I think now it's called W3G or, or so that's a, there are compliance rules set up to uh, for under the ADA legislation, which will allow the people uh, who are, are, you know, blind or differently abled to have to be able to do all the things or that a general public be able to do it another question is how many companies actually comply 100 percent to that and i know it's it's it, it is not easy it is very difficult you have to rewrite your software to make sure well because you can't see it then you have to make sure that we have appropriate sound for every function, you can't use mouse, so it needs to work on the tabs and all that stuff. But what I don't know is which software uh, complies uh, to to these regulations. If maybe I can try to find out and maybe see in, can talk next week. If if you can use maybe some of those softwares, you will be you'll at least get, be able to see, not be able to know all the information that we know as in terms of, you know, whatever, instead of seeing on the screen, 
be able to get to know through audio. That's what I was trying to say. All right, uh, so that was uh, Palinter. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. Next one is Uber. All right, let me ask questions. Uh, any Palantir or Uber shareholders here? No shareholders? Gosh, we spend like <laughs> 10 minutes. Any Uber shareholders here? Uh, Pishan says Palantir. Uber? Maybe I'll go through the ones if you own, maybe we'll pick up that as first because that probably will be more useful. Any PayPal shareholders? I want to go, want to in Uber, but has gone up, gone up. Uh, Alfred says Uber is too expensive for me right now, so I do not own them. Okay, so we got a uh, PayPal shareholders. Any Pinterest shareholders? Okay, so looks like many of you own PayPal. So let's first do PayPal. Then I'll do Uber. And then uh, probably Pinterest. Let's go in that sequence. PayPal. There we go, PayPal. All right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay. All right, let's look at PayPal. Headline numbers, revenue, $8 billion, grew 9% year over year, gross margin, 40%, operating margin, 22%, $1.4 billion of net income, which grew 50% year over year, uh, operating cash flow, $2.6 billion, grew 64% year over year, free cash flow is $2.4 billion, grew 72% year over year, uh, and EPS is 1.29 as earning per share, uh, which grew 60% year over year. So, so far, all numbers look good, right? Revenue, they actually beat the revenue. Um, then they also beat EPS. Operating margin has been highest of past five quarters. We've been in like mid-teens. Now we are 21%. Net income is highest. It has ever been uh, like up 72%. Uh, look at the, let's look at some of the business metrics, right? Active accounts, 426 million. Number of transactions, 6 billion. Total payment volume is 409 uh, billion, which grew 15% year over year. US based grew 11%. International is growing much faster, which is 22%, right? Then there are some in number on take rates. So I'm not going to read through all of them, but what I like is uh, transaction per active account is grew, that grew 14% year over year. So one thing is if you say, hey, it's a social media company, or oh, it's a user count is going down, that is bad. So user is 426 million, not user, active account 426 million, down 2% year over year. Maybe bad, right? Accounts are coming down. Shouldn't it be going up? That's what maybe you want to focus on. But uh, we'll go through that. So they actually beat, they beat total payment volume. Uh, transaction volume is growing in mid-teens, right? 13%. I am okay with not growing active accounts. If you go back two years ago, Three, two years, three years back, the previous CEO, Dan Schulman, <clears throat> the previous management was very much focused on growing active accounts. And then they had a projections to get to 750 million active accounts by 
2025. Right? But that really didn't pan out because you got accounts, but they're not transacting. Right? And then you saw PayPal, you know, uh, along with every other company valuations, you know, the, the payment tech or a fintech uh, went down the drain. PayPal also went down the drain. And then the dare to change the strategy thing, rather than blindly focusing on growing the active accounts, we want to focus on having the existing accounts or the having the accounts transact more with us. But growing an account doesn't bring any dollars, right? unless you start transacting. So I'm happy to see that the transactions per active account is growing at a pace of $14. Right? And there was strong international growth growing at 22% year over year. Uh, looking at the annual numbers, right? uh, 20, almost $30 billion annual revenue, 40% gross margin, 60% operating margin. The reason you know these are less is because they measured the revenue come from interchange. And the payment processing is a dog eat dog business. It is cutthroat business. So I'm surprised that you know getting even a 16% operating margin is, is huge. And they have around almost $20 billion in cash and cash equivalents. So this quarter was all fine. I mean, they beat on revenue, they beat on EPS. These are the two things that street generally looks at, but the stock got punished because the guidance. So now let's look at guidance. So what their guidance was for the next quarter is EPS, mid single digit, um, and your uh, will do, uh, sorry, the Mid single digit growth means the the last year it uh, Q1 and 23, and they run on a they did 1.17, so they are not gonna grow it by too much. What killed the stock was financial year 24 guidelines where they say non EPS, basically adjusted EPS, almost no growth. So it's only five dollar ten cents was 23 year EPS. We're going to have the same one in 24. Street didn't like it. Guys, we are growing the business. We are becoming more profitable. How come you're coming and say that you're not going to grow the EPS? And that killed the stock. Just in the recent quarter, the EPS was 1.48. Uh, per share and now they are saying you know I'll be closer to 1.17 that's not gonna work out and and I think that's where the street punished the stock they also gave a guidance of free cash flow approximately five billion dollar share repurchase at least five billion dollar probably they're gonna do more of five billion dollar but this sounds a little fuzzy guidance uh, what I also liked was the last sentence is beginning with PayPal Q124 earnings report. Non EPS guidance will be updated to include stock based compensation, expense, and related payroll taxes. They are doing job which I wish every other company does, which is tell me the true cost. Don't accounting allows you to give you flexibility to whether you want to include stock based or not. Most of the companies won't, but they say we will include it which is a great thing, right? Uh, shareholder friendly actions. There's, it's gonna be a record buyback, five billion plus. That means they can buy back almost eight and a half percent of the company. Uh, they'll be doing a better reporting of expenses, which is already talked about. So currently where the stock is, PayPal, if you look at, what, $58? Let's extend it. It is back to where it used to trade in 2017. Twenty seventeen. Six years. 
or it's, rather it's the end of 2017. So it's almost, uh, yeah, six and a half years. It's back to where it used to be. Right. So given where it is trading right now, you know, I'm bullish on this and let's see why. PayPal is a global player. It is operates on over 200 countries, including China. And I think this is the only company which is allowed to have a payroll processing in China. Right? PayPal also has Venmo and Braintree. So I just took this Google Trend screenshot in terms of worldwide. Who are when come for searching is app. You know, Apple Pay, Argent, Paytm, Mercado Pago, which is Latin America, PayPal. We agree that the PayPal interest is coming down, but it's still much higher than the rest of the players. Right. So it has got a top of mind share, looking at overall internationally. Uh, it is projected to do $40 billion in 2027. Right. Plus it has got a, you know, if this crypto economy really turns out to be become an integral part of a regular economy, they will pay USD, which is their stable coin. We got a new CEO, we got a new CFO. So we got a new team that is for that needs to prove themselves. The six innovations that they talked about in their investor day, which we covered later on, probably will take time to play out, but it will help in growth. Right, probably that's the most amount of innovation that we have seen after a long time. They are focused on profitable growth and not the mindless growth. So that's where I don't want to chase and increase the total number of active accounts just because I want to increase that number. I would want to increase it if only it comes with them transacting more. So. Everyone got the memo in 2022 that, guys, you need to fix your business. Mindless growth in the mindless growth in higher interest rate regime doesn't work. If I have a zero interest rate, probably everyone will still then go back to, guys, doesn't cost us to invest it, to, to spend anything. Why not spend? Why not get more and more users? Uh, they also announced, they had announced reduction in workforce by 9%. I think they let go of 1,000 people or something. Uh, I hope, I'm expecting that there'll be more reductions, right? If the CEO has to really turn around the company. Uh, so let's see. Uh, positive European market tailwinds. In Europe, uh, the regulator have, the regulators, and it's been, I think, two weeks ago, they passed a regulation that Apple Pay has Apple has to open up Apple Pay for uh, other uh, integrators. So that probably could serve as a tailwind. They got almost $20 billion in cash or cash equivalents, which is like almost one third of the market cap is held in cash. So if you go back, look at a PayPal, its market cap is what around $60 billion. That was like when I checked, when I made this document, $63 billion. Right? And they have almost $20 billion in cash and cash equivalents. Someone may acquire them too for such a huge cash position. They had a record Q4 because they beat on margin, beat on transaction per revenue, beat on revi the overall revenue number, beat on total payment volume. So the Q4 was great. This is guidance was what that killed the shares. Okay. So I really want to give a management some more time to really shock the world. Right. And let me put this in quotes because, you know, I, and I think on the negative side is, let me just add the negative, right? Bearish is, First time CEO. So Alex Chris, he's never been a CEO before. So he's doing the mistakes like a newbie mistakes 
uh, which as a CEO one could do, which is more about how to communicate to investors. Right? He, he committed that mistake when he came on to CNBC and told we have an investor day, we're gonna showcase our innovations. Then he also told we're gonna shock the world. What he meant was we're gonna shock the world over a period of a year, but when you talk two things together, investors will think you're gonna shock the world. So the stock went up in anticipation of that um, investor day. And let me go back. That was the in anticipation of investor day. Stock went up from 57 all the way to like 65. And when the investor day happened, then we realized, well, these are not world changing innovations. We really didn't get shocked. We thought there will be actually someone from their uh, product team, CEO will come and do investor day like other companies do investor day. Right? It was an 18 minute recorded video and then the share got punished. So it was like, a, if you go on a Twitter, it just blew up. So yeah, he's committing the first time mistakes like a newbie on communication side. Other mistake he committed is in giving the guidance is guys, if you're not sure, saying in line with your prior one, don't even put it. Just say that because you haven't given revenue guidance because you are saying that there's uncertainty because we are changing our business. So we don't want to guide towards the revenue rather than saying, I'm going to stay in line EPS, whereas if you are talking about we're going to grow the business, we'll have our tailwinds from our revenue growth. We'll have tailwinds from this productivity gains and all that. And then you come and say, we're going to stay in line with the EPS. It doesn't make sense. So I think he needs to know what to communicate. I'm not saying you have to communicate the wrong information, but you could say that, you know, we'll come back and tell you about our revenue and, and EPS projections when you have more information. Right. There are many companies that don't give their guidance. And if you're setting expectations, I think it's all about setting expectations. <laughs> uh, so it's a first time CEO. I think he's learning the rope. So I want to give him some time. Looking at that, the stock is trading back where it was in 2017. I just pulled this from stock analysis. We just, and I'm looking at a business. Overall revenue is up more than twice. Overall gross profit is up almost twice. Operating income is up more than twice, two and a half. Net income is up more than two and a half. Shares, number of shares have actually come down over the last seven years. EPS is up more, almost two and a half times. I'm like, <laughs> from my perspective, I'm like, I'm not going to sell the stock that I own. Am I gonna buy it right away? Because I already own the stock, I probably not gonna buy the stock right now because overall the market is a euphoria, right? But I will want to sell, I would want to sell puts at opportune time or maybe a stock goes down to 50, 50 or 55, probably then I'll pick a stock. Otherwise I'm gonna opportunistically sell put on this to bring up the position to a level, you know, where I when I'm like, okay, now I'm not gonna add anymore. So as you guys know, I've been adding PayPal for as many weeks. I've been at 50 added, 55, 58, I added. So I already built my position on it. That's why I'm not gonna build, not gonna go aggressive on this one. But again, did the stock get punished? Yes. Was it justified? Absolutely. Because the CEO did a bad job in terms of like zero growth EPS. But is it as bad as that it needs to trade at the 2017 valuation? I don't think so. Could I could be wrong. You know, I've been wrong on many stocks, but I just look at the number. I just look at the business. I don't think it's ad, as bad. Business is as bad as the stock is. So bad stock, better business is alpha, right? B bad, good stock, bad business is short alpha. 
So, so right now this gives us a long alpha position. So that's payback. Okay, you do what you want to do with your position, uh, but uh, I think right now, to me, this seems to be, a, a, if, you, if I don't already hold, I'll probably buy it, but I already have a position in it. Sam says, Alibaba buying at $25 billion. Yes. Alibaba is going to do $25 billion, which is like they're going to buy back some 1820. Uh, uh, they're going to buy back and, and they're going to increase the buyback. And that is why if the, if Alibaba was incorporated and the company in the US will be buying hand over fist. Right? Just because it is in, I can't put a dollar amount to the CCP risk and I already have position in, in, in Baba. I'm just sitting tight. Uh, the point is, uh, it's more than their uh, current free cash flow. Their free cash flow is $21 billion right now. That's fine. They might have already have the results from a previous years, which they can utilize to buy back the stock. So this free cash flow is from whatever this quarter but they already might have a, had a, a reserve. Right? What you may want to do is to look at their cash and cash equivalents. That will tell how much of a cash and cash equivalents they have, which they can utilize maybe to buy back some of the stock. Arun says this drop could create opportunity for their buyback program for PayPal. Yes. And I hope that they, that they buy back. So PayPal is trading at what valuation? Let's look at uh let's go to no stock analysis uh oh where's the rush oh i think price or so paypal is trading at the cheapest that it has ever been on the free cash flow basis i mean except uh no it's ever been in last whatever I have this has got 10 years worth of data. Price or free cash flow. They should be buy back the stock. They should be using this opportunity to buy back the stocks because the stock has never been cheaper in last 10 years. 14. I mean, I'm not saying 14 is extremely cheap, but it is. It is cheap. Look at, and that's why I like, I love Baba, not from a stock perspective. Baba is trading at seven times free cash flow. If I recall my numbers correctly, uh, nine times. Okay, maybe I had missed something, but even nine times is very cheap. So I assume, I, I hope PayPal buys the, buys the stock right now. And not buy it when you know it is trading at uh, forty-five or fifty and all this stuff. So yes, they can use this to buy back the stocks. Mm. All right, so that was PayPal. Okay, uh, okay, we are we are fifteen minutes over. So Uber and Pinterest will do next week. Uh, let's spend some maybe another fifteen minutes for any Q and A. And uh, then we'll call it a day. Sold 68 covered call, kept the premium this week. I had sold uh, 70 covered call when I think PayPal, after the earnings, or not after earnings, after their investor day, it fell down to 61 and all that. The, I, I think at a while I was in watching their investor day presentation after they unveiled on January uh, 22nd, I actually sold 70 covered call, which then got auto closed after this drop. I'm hoping to get it above 60 so that I can sell another covered call. All right, uh, what else? Uh, Uber and Pinterest will cover uh, cover next week. We, we ran out of time.
nothing all good any other company want to cover or caught your attention another one which like look at tsm i don't know what drove this tsm i didn't see any news around tsm i think it's a general semiconductor craziness that's driving tsm so gosh, I'll, I'll i had my covered call which is now in the money that's fine i just rolled it out to march hopefully this madness will subside if not I'll let the share gets called away and then uh, I'll enjoy the gains with the remaining of the shares that I hold. Uh, what other stocks I saw crazy? Uber. Uber did well after earnings. I think Uber went all the way to 70. It was a new all-time high for Uber. 73 bucks. Uh, yeah. I love Dara as a CEO. I, have a in <laughs> I think I said earlier, I have an investor crush on Dara. Shri says, uh, NVIDIA, my call, uh, sell in the money, I will let them have it. Uh, uh, NVIDIA, yeah, sure. So NVIDIA, I the reason why I've been selling NVIDIA is I always did a call spread and then it will always it'll get in the money. Then I'm like, okay, I'll sell the stock for the call spread. I'll go and do another call spread at a higher price. It gets in the money. But this time, my this week sell, I don't have any more because uh, when I did my last sole and close the call spread, I'm like, okay, I think this craziness will stop. So I'm not going to do any more, uh, you know, uh, I, I just want to hold the shares, whatever I have. But that's like, yeah, <laughs> this week it was like, I'm like another 45% year to date. Uh, I took chance to sell a little bit more. But I think the others I'm just going to hold. Uh, uh, oh, we didn't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to talk about it because not many people may own or tell me how many of you own Snap? What a, what a, Snap never disappoints. I'm not talking, I mean, I mean the share was down 35%. Uh, but when I say never disappoints, I mean, Every quarter, it's been consistently that it'll go down. 34%, this, this quarter went on 34%, previous quarter 5%, previously 14%, prior to that 17%, and then 20, I guess 20%, then 36%. <laughs> snap is like, you can you can time your clock saying snap falling down, oh, may, they must have reported earnings results, right? I guess. <laughs> so... No, uh, I think um, bad bad results. A uh, lot of a stock based compensation. So I hold the shares, and I'll, I, I'm not I'm not now not added to my positions. But some of the shares got called away in December because the stock was like whoops, and then uh, probably and then I sold put against at the price which called called away. So probably I'm gonna cut those those back. So I'm just playing the shares that I have. I'm not gonna add any more to Snap. Uh, they're just not able to prove themselves that they can run a business profitably. That's a problem. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can, the shares that I hold is not a big part of my portfolio. It's like a lottery ticket. I'll hold it for the next decade. You go down to zero, that's fine. But if they if we can turn it around or become acquisition target, yeah. I'll write it. Uh, Snap is a cheap now. Um, I mean, the business itself is bad. So I won't say that the stock is cheap. I, I want to get a good business first and then see if I want to buy. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll, we can look at Snap and some days later and see from how their business has done. Uh, do bonds a risk investment to park some money? Oh, that again, I, I come back to the same stuff. If, if uh, I mean, if you want to, let me ask a question. Why you want to own bonds? There are two reasons. Number one could be I I don't care of the capital value of the bond as long as I can get the interest payments. 
from that perspective, yeah, right now I think it's uh, treasuries are paying still paying to four percent. So you can park it and get a four percent risk free. But if you are looking at, let's say, I want to buy the TLTs or other bonds, and my investment thesis is if interest rates will go down, this will go up. Eventually, it will happen. Is it going to happen in March? Probably not because Fed Jerome Powell told he's not going to cut down in March. But that thesis will eventually play out. So now based on what your timeline is, that then you can decide. Let's say worst come worst. And I'm taking extreme case. Inflation come back roaring up because of, uh, you know, uh, co consumer is still strong, still spending. AI is causing all the stock market to go up. People are feeling, feeling wealthy because they're seeing paper gains. When you feel wealthy, you go ahead and shop. <laughs> That's what as Americans we do. <laughs> and let's say inflation goes back up and Jerome Powell comes and says, you know what? I'm going to increase the interest rates. In that case, the bond prices will again crater. So, so keep these things in mind and then decide what you want to do with bonds. Uh, she says, how to earn a decent yield from your sweep account or for the above link? Oh, I should have read this before because I just bought and I didn't mention it in the buys of the week because I didn't think it was relevant. But I bought ICSH because, you know, the, in the TD Ameritrade, in my TD Ameritrade account, because I'm holding more cash than usual, um, I really wanted, I was looking at, you know, is there a sweep options and all that stuff. And uh, rather than, I didn't have time to do the research. And I thought, you know, for now, let me move that money into ICSH. ICSH is an ETF which hold short-term uh, uh, these bonds. So short-term treasury securities, right now it's SEC 30-day yield is 5% plus. I'm like, rather than moving it to treasury direct or moving it to a CD, I'll hold the cash in my brokerage account, but I'll consider ICSH as a cash and uh, we'll show you include it in a percentage of cash and not as a stock. So that is why today when I reviewed what buys and sells, I didn't include IC as such because that's like my cash holding. But maybe I'll, I'll go through this link and see. Uh, but I did this on Friday. I moved cash into ICSH. Well, it gives a 5% return. And if I were to, you know, if market drops and... I have to use the cash to buy the stock, which I'm hold cash I'm holding on the side. I'll sell ICSH and then I'll probably buy the stock. Um, the ICS, uh, the one that you have, the ICSH, SH? Yeah. that uh, provides monthly dividend. So if you need the cash to purchase something, you will lose that dividend, right? But in money market, it is already, there is no, um, dividend uh, payment or anything. So it is already in the market and you can get out at any time. And the yield is supposed to be uh, well, around 5% or something. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, yeah, so, so this is what I'm holding, which I'll hold for a month. Okay, but that's what the, the question is. I mean, if there is something, you have a fall in the market and you have to purchase something and you don't have cash, you have to liquidate this position. Oh, okay, okay. So I've only, I only I I moved my fifty percent of a cash in this, and okay. even if the market falls, I'm not going to buy go all in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I always go in tranches, right? So if a market will fall, let's say five percent, I know how much capital I'm going to put in. I'll wait but for it, if it falls another five percent, I'll then I'm going to bring in more. But the money market account does not pay a dividend, but it is gradually increasing in price, right? Yeah. It, is that is that, is that the link that you sent? That's what a money market accounts? Yeah, because then I'll, I I want to go through that, but I'm like, this is what I did on Friday and I can always sell it. And maybe once I figured out this whole sweep stuff, because the otherwise lying in a cash doesn't, is not earning anything. 
that's a that's the biggest problem so i'm looking at or maybe call td ameritrade and and have them do a cash sweep account these are the options that i have to look at all right so i'll talk to you again uh, next week uh, i think we'll next week we'll have uh, earnings probably and maybe a week after that i'll i'll do a deep dive into uh, a company it's been some time since we did a deep dive uh, but next week probably will still focus on earnings unless you have something else which i haven't heard so far all right talk to you next week bye everyone and uh, have fun watching super bowl uh, whether you are 49ers or kc's good luck to you all bye bye